going on, everybody? It's Buddy. It's your Pals Pass Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check. And this is, yeah, it's not quite a WWE last week, is it? I haven't had very much to talk about. This is going to be a one-off talking about SmackDown, because I kind of had a feeling it was going to be a really fun show. But obviously, it's not going to be uh, your weekly look back at the week that was, as is becoming the cliche phrase for WWE last week. Because, uh, well, I mean, there's other things going on, let's be real. I'm filming this, obviously, it's the day before New Year's Eve, I'm going to have a pretty quiet New Year's, if I'm if I'm honest, I'm not doing very much for the, for the big ball drop, the big countdown to midnight, because I already had a surprise birthday earlier this month, and I celebrated Christmas twice with two different groups of people, and I'm... I'm okay with settling down and going brain dead in front of the TV. It's it's fine. Your buddy Spaz is getting old. It's okay. But the other reason that I haven't been up here very much is because there hasn't really been much of note to talk about. I mean, two Mondays ago, there was a Raw, and I'll go through those things very, very quickly. We established that Alexa Bliss is going to face Bianca Belair next Monday. We established that Rollins is going to face uh, Austin Theory next Monday for their respective titles, of course. Uh, we had the Bloodline invade Raw, which... I mean, it was really good, because everything that the Bloodline does is really good. We got a great uh, Sami Zayn versus AJ Styles match out of nowhere. We got the Usos versus... Uh, Kevin Owens and uh, and Seth Rollins, which was which was really good. Um, problem being is they were all set to hype up the match that they were having on SmackDown against Hit Row, and that SmackDown had been already taped, and we already knew what was going on, and it wasn't much to get uh, much to get excited for. So it was good, and it was well done, and all that, but it was all much for muchness, if if you get my meaning. Um, and uh, the other thing I will say is Rhea Ripley wrestled Akira Tozawa, which a lot of people really liked, you know, hinting towards intergender wrestling. You guys know where I stand. I think if they do proper intergender wrestling, that's great. If we do, uh, the guys aren't allowed to throw a punch, so they're just there to get their ass kicked by women. That doesn't help anybody. It makes the women look weak in a certain way, and it makes the guys into jokes. See James Ellsworth. See Sasha Banks absolutely burying Reggie to the former that he is. Why are we beeping? Why is this a thing? see uh, Reggie being buried to the point that he is scripts now, and I mean, Tozawa, there's no problem, like, Tozawa could fight back against Rhea Ripley, Rhea Ripley's still gonna win, Rhea Ripley's a beast, it's fine, we're gonna talk more about her later, the other thing that I will say that was really fun, except it's another person that's been brought in as another heavy for the Miz, and that's Bronson Reed, um, I think that's kinda cool in a way, cause Bronson Reed's a monster, obviously, um, Obviously, The Miz is going to go and find monsters to defend him. He's going to... He's ever, forever on the search for his Diesel. Is he not? And that's absolutely fine. But, uh, I mean, we're going to get some tag matches. It's going to be him and Bronson Reed versus Johnny Gargano and Dexter Loomis going into January, isn't it? That... I, I'm almost heartbroken with how much that makes sense, because it makes sense in a very boring way. Bronson Reed was really cool on NXT. I was really bummed when... Uh, when uh, he got let go, you know, like we are with a lot of people that got let go during the uh, during the COVID releases, etc. You know, we don't have anything for you. We've got budget cuts, righty righty raw. The old regime. We don't need to talk about it anymore. Although, I am, I'm not okay. I won't say that this makes up for him being released. I was kind of happy to hear that he found himself some success in Japan. I saw him uh, doing some pretty cool thing. His match with Josh Alexander in Impact was also really, really good. Uh, so I'm, gl as a guy that I like, I was bummed to see him gone at the same time, happy to hear him having some cool stories elsewhere. And because it was Impact, because it was New Japan, and because it wasn't AEW, there wasn't that immediate, ha 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 ha, we have him now mentality. And now he's back because Papa H is back. Papa H is assembling the Infinity Gauntlet as much as uh, guys like uh, Michael Sidgwick don't like that analogy, but it is absolutely true. I, personally, would have loved to just come and see him monster somebody. I would have loved to see Dexter Loomis be done with The Miz, and then Bronson Reed comes in on his own accord and monsters Dexter Loomis. Or even, you know what, maybe I'm shooting for the stars here, you could have had him monster somebody like Bobby Lashley, because Bobby Lashley versus Bronson Reed, shoot me if you want to, Bobby Lashley versus Bronson Reed would be a nice, cool kind of throw away, but still really intriguing match for the Royal Rumble. Is it not Royal Rumble, as we always say, is that that one pay-per-view where even the title matches don't have to be the greatest because they're not the focal point. Um, 
That would have been really cool for that. But right now he's going to go for the Miz. And then what's he going to do? He's going to turn on the Miz, like Dexter Loomis turned on the Miz, like Alex Riley turned on the Miz, like that uh, that youngster uh, Daniel Bryan turned on the Miz, like the Miz fits, or sorry, the. Miz Taraj, didn't they eventually turn on the Miz as well? Even his wife has pretended to turn on him because they're smart. Um, but yeah, long story short, Bronson Reed is back. I think that's really cool. We're going to get to see what he can do. And when he breaks off from the Miz thing, uh, he'll go do great things. And the Miz will go on continuing to be completely underrated by this company and its fans, which is a really unfortunate thing. NXT, what can I say? NXT is really awkward to watch right now in the in the aftermath of the Mandy Rose situation. I gave my thoughts on the Mandy Rose situation at the end of the last WWE last week. Um, what do you call it? The last, the last WWE last week that I did. There we go. Um, two things coming out of this week's NXT is we've got two matches set for uh, New Year's Evil. One of them is Grayson Waller versus Braun Breaker, which we already knew about. Um, that's going to be a lot of fun. I got to believe Breaker's going to the main roster, so Grayson Waller's probably going to be your new NXT champion, driving everybody nuts. Indusher versus the Creeds is the other one that's been set for New Year's Evil. Also, we have, um, we have some weird hardcore match coming up this week between uh, Isla Dawn and Alba Fire, which should be a lot of fun. But Indusher versus the Creeds for New Year's Evil, it's funny because when they first sort of hinted at this Indusher thing, it wasn't really, I hate to say what I've already said for other things, but it was all much for muchness. It was four big guys that were going to collide, and it didn't, you couldn't really make heads or tails of it. Because who are the Creed Brothers right now? They're a fun team, they're part of Diamond Mine, but what really is Diamond Mine? Diamond Mine is the two of them and the two girls. We don't know where Roderick Strong is. Is Roderick Strong still in the company? Are the Creeds just Diamond Mine on their own now? One of them's injured, one of them's not injured, etc. On the other side of the coin, you had Sanga, who was, you know, playing the locker room leader for a while, total babyface, until his brother, who's a heel, came back and said, oh, you know, it's about time we turned you into a heel, so he's a heel now. But but they're being healy while respecting the baby faces enough until they get to the match. So at this point, I feel like it's a match that I'm intrigued by virtue of the fact that they've dragged it out so long. So it must be something. I don't know what that says about anything. I really don't. But one of these teams has got to be the next in line for the titles right now, right? Like that, that has to be, that has to be a thing that like, the Creeds versus the New Day could be fun. Indus Sheer versus the New Day, I think, would be unintentionally hilarious. But, um, you know, you're going to get uh, Briggs and Jensen back in there. You're going to get the New Day back in there. You're going to get Pretty Deadly back in there. Um, I don't know who else you want to throw in there. You're going to get, uh, what, Chase U in there and, and all kinds of things. But if you had told me that I would have been interested in this match like three, four weeks ago when we thought it was going to happen, I would say no, but now... It's, it's had that weird dragging effect. Into Sheer on their own, do I care? Not really. The Creed's on their own, do I care? Not really. But they've dragged this out for so goddamn long. Um, I don't know what they're going to do. So that's intriguing. So let's get to the main event. Let's talk about tonight's SmackDown. Um, so yeah, uh, long story short, we had that Raw. Sorry, as I go on my ramble as to why you haven't heard from me in a bit. We had that Raw. We had the pre-taped SmackDown, which was very uneventful. Can't blame them. It's pre-taped. The spoilers are going to get out. You don't want to waste any of your big stuff. And then we had a clip show Raw. We had a clip show Raw, which was best of the best of the year. Roddy, Roddy, Raw that ended off. The last thing on that best of the year thing was Logan Paul versus Roman Reigns in Saudi Arabia, which a lot of people aren't going to like. But it means, like, how am I going to review a clip show that's reviewing the year? Like, I'm not going to do that. And I thought, okay, I'll just come back in the new year. And then they started building this SmackDown and building this SmackDown and building this SmackDown. I said, you know what? If the SmackDown's good, I'll come up and talk about it. And it'll give me a chance to talk about things in general. I do still have one other thing that I'm going to toss you guys as sort of an end-of-year thing, but you might get it in the first week of January rather than the last week of December, considering that's coming in like two days. So there is one more technically piece of 2022 content that you're going to get from me. Still working on it. We'll see what happens when we get there. But this SmackDown, if I can rally and finally get to my point was a really good SmackDown. It started off with Bray Wyatt coming in. They replayed the attack on the cameraman from last week. He says, 
I'm not, I don't really see myself as a good person, but I do try to be a good person. I don't regret very much in my life. In fact, I've enjoyed a lot of it, but I do want to apologize to that, uh, to that cameraman. If he's watching tonight, he didn't really deserve that, man. And LA Knight comes out right away, cuts him off. He says, you know, Mr. Mind Games, Mr. Head Games, Mr. Wyatt, beaten by the megastar LA Knight. I got you snapping on everybody. You paid some goon to dress up like Uncle Howdy, Uncle Howdy a couple weeks ago just to cover up the fact of what we all know you've done. You used to be a force in the WWE. What the hell happened? I'll tell you what happened. You're a loser now. I'm the medicine, and I'm going to break your ass like dishes at the Royal Rumble. And I'm sorry, break your ass like dishes is the line of 2022. It just is. Uh, they set out the Rumble Challenge, and um, Wyatt doesn't say very much. They're keeping... He still has his, his rambly way of speaking, but they're doing it in short bits. And it's, it's almost weirder to have what we expect to be this long, drawn-out thing come out in short bits, because you feel like you're not getting it all. But, he says, I need to remind you how cruel I can be when I feel like it, I accept for the Royal Rumble, and then immediately we get that graphic and that, that glitchy video on the Titan Tron, revel in what you are, etc. Uncle Howdy comes out. Uncle Howdy's got his own entrance music, and it kind of sounds like demented music box, demented circus, orchestra type stuff, but like tuned way down and made darker. Basically, if there was a horror movie about a circus, this is the music that would be in there. That's the best I can give you guys. I'm really sorry. I'm, and people are screaming it from the rooftops that the guy, the guy in the Uncle Howdy costume is clearly different. Can't you see his, his body's a little smaller and his arms are a little thinner and whatever. Uncle Howdy's an idea until they take that mask off, until they take the mask off, until they take the costume off, until he like throws throws off his jacket and has a match. Uncle Howdy's just an idea. Anybody can be Uncle Howdy. I'm sorry, I hate to break that to you, but Uncle Howdy can be anybody right now. Um, he stands right up right next to Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt looks sort of triumphant in a way because it proves that, you know, Uncle Howdy's a real person. Uncle Howdy's not him, da-da-da-da-da. So you think the two of them are going to kick the crap out of L.A. Knight. And instead, in the dim light of the Uncle Howdy effect, uh, for lack of a better term, Uncle Howdy hits a Sister Abigail on Bray Wyatt and leaves. He takes his top hat with him and he's, as he leaves. So, uh, long con game, obviously Uncle Howdy and, and Bray Wyatt are, are a unit, they're from the same universe, they're from the same whatever. I love when they say, hey, we don't really know how these guys are related when literally one of them has uncle in the name, but that's another story for another day. L.A. Knight having to sell this on the outside, what's going on, man, this is getting weirder and weirder, yeah! Uh, is not the greatest, but I just, I love this shit, guys. You guys know this. I know this, and for, <laughs> it won't be the last time I say this tonight. Part of the reason I love this is because, say it with me, it pisses off all the right people. Oh, yes. In the back, we see Sami Zayn catching up with Paul Heyman on his way to go see Roman Reigns. They wish themselves a happy Hanukkah and a happy Ramadan, which is very, very nice. In the holiday season, a lot of it gets... Um, joined up with uh, Christmas and New Year's and a lot of the other holidays fall by the wayside. No problem with this whatsoever, with them w wishing them their according holidays, etc. I've always said, um, to the people who say you shouldn't say Merry Christmas, their, uh, their um, example to me is always, oh, well, how would you feel if somebody wished you a Happy Hanukkah? I'm like, well, it would make my fucking day. Next question. So I'm going to say Merry Christmas. Somebody wants to say Happy Hanukkah to me. Somebody wants to say Happy Ramadan to me. Somebody wants to say, hey, we're watching SmackDown. It must be Friday. Happy fucking Friday. I'll take that as well. It's all good because it starts with happy. And all things that start with happy are good, except Corbin. That's why we gave him his first name back. Moving swiftly on, um, Paul Heyman tries to give him a couple of tips about the other week when they were cutting their promo in the ring when he was speaking very passionately about what it meant to be in the bloodline. And it was all good and we believed it all and all that type of thing. But the, the thing that was bad for the optics was the, the undisputed champion, the tribal chief, the head of the table, the head of the bloodline, Roman Reigns, was in the ring and they were chanting, Sammy. Did you ever think about what that might do to the group, etc.? And then he gets a text. He says, "Oh, you've got a green light now. You can go see the go see the tribal chief. Go see Roman Reigns." And he's just he starts questioning himself, and it's like, "Oh dear, oh dear." He had a problem with the one brother. Had a problem with the other brother. The other brother's starting to question things now. Solo Sokoa is just standing there, stone faced as Solo Sokoa. Paul Heyman's now giving him warnings, and now he's walking into a Roman Reigns that may or may not be upset with him. 
Very, very good. Very, very nice 2023 seed planting. It's very good. Seamus with the Brawling Brutes in his corner versus Solo Sokoa with the Usos in his corner. And commentary goes out of their way to remind us that Sami Zayn would be in his corner as well, if not for the big main event that he was preparing for tonight. That was a nice touch. Michael Cole, I will say, before we start talking about this match, Michael Cole taking a moment to acknowledge the passing of Don West and saying, and I think... A lot of people said that this came off as like a, a corny line. I, I think he meant it to be as representative as he possibly could. He wants. He said he wanted to pay respect to Don Callis, a fellow broadcaster who had a great impact on the wrestling world. Yes, it means yes. He means he was from Impact Wrestling. We get it. It's fine. And yes, it is a pun. But I don't think he was necessarily making fun of the guy with the pun. I think it was very very nice for Michael Cole to take his microphone in his two seconds, whether he was given the green light or whether he sort of wedged it in there in the middle, uh, to pay pay a little bit of uh, acknowledgement to, uh, to Don West, because anybody that watched TNA in its heyday knows that Don West was the was the energy. I mean, Mike Tanay was the, was the guy. Mike Tanay was the one telling you the story as you were sitting there watching TV. But Don West was the energy. Um, for a modern comparison... I, I would compare him to maybe Pat McAfee. Pat McAfee for a long time was the definitive uh, energy and attitude and whatever you want to say of the commentary table on SmackDown. Since he's gone to do his football stuff and since Wade Barrett has been there, I like Wade Barrett. I really do. I like Wade Barrett specifically on NXT and then you get into the Booker T conversation, which I'm not trying to have right now. But Pat McAfee is noticeably not there on SmackDown because of the energy that he brings. Don West... In his own way, not in the same way, but he was the energy of that commentary booth for so long in TNA and back when, I hate to say this in, in this context, but back when it was good, back when it had a bigger audience, back when it was on proper TV, etc., in its, in its heyday, in its infancy, in its pomp and circumstance, a lot of those stories were told by Mike Tanay and Don West. So... Really, really cool acknowledgement from Michael Cole. I don't know what people are freaking out about. Um, obviously, not that anybody's going to hear this on my podcast, but uh, rest in peace to Don West. Uh, thoughts out to his friends, family, his co-workers, the TNA Impact family, um, however you want to say it. That's There's just no good way around it. Uh, there was a lot of stuff around last year. I think there was some, some, some GoFundMes or something similar to that just supporting him and his family, and you want to hope that that shit's going to get better, not worse, and apparently, apparently it didn't, and that's a, that's a real, that's a real bummer, but I was really happy to hear them at least acknowledge that on SmackDown. Anyways, getting back to the match at hand, it's Sheamus versus Solo Sokoa, obviously it's a big battle of the bulls, that's the big cliche, what I love from Solo Sokoa is every now and then when he knocks somebody down, he's got this way of taking a step back with his hand out, like, like, as if he's saying, like, who the fuck is this guy? But at the same time, he, when he does that with that cocky arrogance, it's immediately transformed into anger when the guy gets back up as to almost like, how dare you get up? It's a very quick couple of seconds game to play. And when you can work it into a match more than once, I think it's really, really good. Um, Seamus does manage to toss him to the outside at one point, which makes him lose his, lose his shit a little bit. He grabs a chair, and the Usos have to pull the Sammy roll. They have to pull, like, the solo whisperer mode um, and get the chair away from him, get him back on track, get him back in the ring. I like this story. I like this story of Solo Sokoa potentially being his own worst enemy in matches, where he's really, really good as long as he's in charge, and as soon as he's not in charge, he's going to lose it, and he's going to cost himself the match, or he's going to do himself a damage, or he's going to open himself up to whatever. So he needs somebody whispering in his ear. He needs Sami Zayn whispering in his ear. In this case, he needed the Usos, his brothers, whispering in his ear. Maybe on another day, it'll it'll only be Paul Heyman, because all the rest of the guys are busy, you know, being the solo whisperer, as I've said. But I'm, I'm almost curious now if they're going to do a thing where he goes off on his own after the bloodline breaks up, and he does become his own worst enemy, because they're planting the seeds for that right here, right now. I think it's really, really good. Um, they brawl on the post. Or sorry, they brawl outside. Shamitz eats the post on the outside. There's a Uranagi on the apron, which is more or less him just, like, slumping him onto the apron. You can't... You can do a power bomb or a choke slam because you can get high elevation on those things, but anything like a rock bottom where you're basically lifting somebody at shoulder level and that's sort of where the apron is, you're basically placing them. And that's not a knock on these guys because they still manage to make it look badass. It's just do, do something different. It would almost be more effective if he had left him on the ground and speared him because at least then there's a direct 
a direct impact. Um, Yuranagi on the apron, Samoa and Spike when they get back in the ring. Uh, I do like the fact that he's doing a lot of the Umaga stuff. That's really cool. Um, from the high impact hip attack to the Samoan Spike to the... Um, what was it? The Umaga had some kind of slam that he did too. I can't think of the name of it right now, obviously. But he wins with the Samoan Spike, post-match assault. It's three on three. Sheamus and the Brutes are out there with Solo and the Usos. Uh, Solo and the Usos get the upper hand, so Drew McIntyre comes out and chases everybody away. We find out why he does that later on in the night. But I said this before, and it's not the first time they've done it with this collection of guys. Um, the baby, face chase, baby faces chasing away the heels with a four on three advantage for the baby faces doesn't really make them look like baby faces. It makes them look like a group that needed, that had a three on three equal situation that they couldn't handle. Now, the counter argument to that is obviously going to be, well, nobody can hold up against the bloodline. They're the biggest thing going in WWE right now. I understand that. Don't, but don't underline that fact because the more you underline that fact, the more everybody else looks bad. You want to think that any group of people could potentially try their luck with the bloodline. Hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. You want to think, even if it's not true, that Imperium can go up against the bloodline. You want to think, even though it's not true, that Legato del Fantasma could go up against the bloodline. You want to think, even though it's not true, that if Big E came back surprisingly in the Royal Rumble or something like that, that the New Day could go up against the bloodline, even if it's not true. You want to think that the Brawling Brutes could go up even if they can't, even if it's not true, against the bloodline. You want to you want to plant the idea in people's heads that the bloodline will destroy everybody, but you also want to create that 1% of, yeah, but what if they don't? Because we got a lot of that tonight, too. Um, so it's not the end of the world by any stretch of the imagination, and there is a reason for it that we will talk about uh, later on in the night. But, yeah, for now, for the baby phases being saved and feeling triumphant because they had a four-on-three advantage, not the best way to end it, but it was a good match. It was a really good match between two absolute bulldozers. You knew exactly what you were going to get out of them, and it was absolutely fine. What was uh, not so fine, was kind of weird, was they replayed the women's gauntlet match from last week. Now, I didn't review this because, like I say, it was the pre-taped SmackDown. Everybody already knew it was going to happen. Who cares what I think about a pre-taped SmackDown leading into a clip show Raw, all that kind of thing. But, I mean, of course Raquel Rodriguez won the gauntlet match because, of course, she won the gauntlet match. She came in... Already not 100%, already with her arm in a mechanical device, beat everybody in the match with her arm so not good that it's in a mechanical device, and then dispensed of a fresh surprise Shayna Baszler while her arm is so bad that it's in a mechanical device and she's already fought off five other people. Not great, not great, not great. Also, the mechanical uh, the mechanical cast that she had on kept on falling apart during the match, so that didn't make the match look great either. But what you're telling me is an already not 100% Raquel Rodriguez, who then went into a match with six other people and barely scraped a win, easily dispatched this monster in Shayna Baszler, who's supposed to be the vice to the end-of-level boss, and she just got thrown away like paper, and that's that wasn't great. That wasn't great. They're trying to do a good thing. They're trying to bring back the Shayna Baszler that we all like. Uh, and doing this thing with Ronda Rousey is both a catalyst for that and something that's going to keep her down at the same time. Ronda Rousey's the one that's giving her the kick in the ass and being like, look, you need to be that monster again. But also, as long as she's with Ronda Rousey, she's typecast as a sidekick, which isn't great. So that whole dynamic, unless the two of them they don't have to win them, obviously, because I think it'll be like monstering the titles at that point. But if they don't at some point at least acknowledge, hey, we are two women, there is a title that exists in this company for pairs of women. If they don't even take a side glance at, uh, at damage control and those tag team titles, then somebody has missed something. Oh, yes. Now, Bailey can get involved and they can scrape away with their titles and whatever and then that causes the rift between the two of them and then that causes the match between the two of them and that's fine but if they never look at the opportunity for those two to become tag team champions then WWE are missing something because they would be the monster team they would by default Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler would be the Usos of the women's tag team division but 
it's neither here nor there. I think the next holders for those championships are going to be Liv Morgan and Tegan Knox, and I have no problem with that whatsoever. Other than, we got to find a steady partner for my girl Shotzi, and she needs to get a title shot as well. If they hadn't lost Ember Moon slash Athena, they could have brought that tag team up to the main roster, and they would have ruled, and they wouldn't have uh, thrown the belts on John Laurinaitis' desk like little brats. Oh, yes. And then run away to Japan. Raquel Rodriguez versus Ronda Rousey is what I'm trying to get around to right here. Really, really good. The arm is still taped. At least it's not in the mechanical arm brace anymore. Like, taped up is enough. Braced up is enough. The mechanical arm brace was just weird. Um, they do the they do the psychology thing early on with uh, Raquel Rodriguez purposely doing power moves, uh, slams and throws and all these types of uh, of uh, power displays, basically overcompensating. Like, if you think there's anything wrong with my arm, you're wrong. See. Uh, and then she eats shit on the post, and it's the same bad arm. And then Ronda Rousey proceeds to dissect the arm for a long time. She does this modified version of the triangle choke in the ropes, so that she's being choked on one rope, she's having her arm pulled over another rope, and Ronda Rousey's just, as I'm, I'm moving my hands around, as if you guys can see me, but she's sort of hovering above Raquel, and the ropes, and it looks really, really effective purely because it's Ronda doing it, but at the same time, it's weird. As they come back in the ring, there's a lot more counter-wrestling, and she gets her back into a Kimura. Now, what I will say is hysterical about this, because we're telling a story about somebody's one broken arm, and or sorry, injured arm, so we're going to focus on the arm only, right? It's funny when you see Shayna Baszler standing in the background in her bright yellow new t-shirt, because all, all it says on the Shayna Baszler new t-shirt is limb by limb. So when you see the limb by limb shirt, as Ronda Rousey, her friend, is taking apart somebody's limb, it makes me smile. I'm a child. Small things make me smile. It's okay. Um, they did they did a spot here, and I don't think it was meant to look as awkward as it did. But also, in its awkwardness, it also kind of looked great. She went for the uh, I can't pronounce it properly, the Chingona bomb, the one arm choke slam, one arm power bomb thing that she does. And Ronda Rousey sort of sits herself on Raquel's shoulder and tries to turn it into what would be a head scissor, but in this case is an arm scissor over the ropes. But Raquel finds her feet again and keeps her up in that power bomb position on the floor and really awkwardly drops her on the apron. And it, it was kind of botchy, but it, I will say they managed to salvage it enough that it was one of those botchy moves that looked more impactful for how botchy it was, if that makes sense. Yes, I don't think it went the way they wanted it to, but I still think it looked good. Uh, back in the ring, there's a backpack sleeper by Ronda, and instead of... I do like this. This was a bit different, because typically, somebody's in a backpack sleeper, you either turn it into a backpack stunner, or you fall backwards so that they have to break the hold, or you back them into the corner. Well... Raquel Rodriguez sort of did the opposite. Is She sort of did what you would normally do if you were going to eat the post shoulder first. Is She sort of speared in between the second and third rope so that Ronda Rousey's face, who was on top of her, would go face first into the turnbuckle. And I thought, you know what? That's not much. But she broke it in the way that we all didn't... Ex or, sorry. She didn't break it in the way that I think all of us would have expected her to do it. And that's enough sometimes to make you go, oh, okay, that was cool. That was a bit different. Um... Arm, she gets her in a term. Uh, sorry, she gets her in another arm bar as they're both standing on the top turnbuckle. Rhonda does that is, and then as she's got the arm bar on, obviously it's being counted because it's in the ropes. They basically fall back into the ring, and she suffers the impact to the arm while the arm is already in a submission. That brings us to a quick tap out and Rhonda getting the win. Um, I don't know how much we're supposed to believe Raquel Rodriguez was into this match still injured, going from last week, technically, which was actually taped from two weeks ago, where she had this big mechanical thing holding her arm together, to today, where she just had a, a bit of tape. But she's having that one... Uh, sort of red flashing limb, if you want to use a video game term, um, being worked on by an MMA professional, submission professional, etc., with a little bit of help from Shayna Baszler on the outside as well that I forgot to mention. Um, her arm should be torn rags at this point, but it wasn't. So, if she was partially healed, then it's okay. It's a valiant effort and whatever. If we're supposed to believe that she was like inches away from a broken arm walking into this match. There's no reason this match should have gone this long. So you don't... My questioning is not with them, it's not with the match. The match is great. My questioning is more how injured did WWE want us to think she was when she went in. I didn't think she was going to win. I thought she was going to 
go in there, have a valiant effort, say, you know, come out with it, you know, be the valiant, uh, be the valiant defeated and have a post-match interview where she says, okay, I know what I have to do now. I know I can beat her. I'm going to go win the Royal Rumble and I'm going to get another shot at WrestleMania. Make one of those kind of speeches. Instead, instead, Ronda Rousey's, uh, triumphant posing in the ring, etc., is interrupted by what sounds like Ric Flair music. Which is odd. I mean, I know they're pushing the Ric Flair, um, they're pushing the Ric Flair documentary, the Woo documentary, uh, every chance they get. But I didn't think Ric Flair was going to be there on the night. And then I thought, oh, this is a this is a new thing for Charlotte. And then they pan to Charlotte, in the and she looks all happy and wonderful. And Charlotte Flair is back, and there's a huge pop. So. For all the people that uh, think, oh well, why would why why we're so worried about Charlotte coming back? Um, there's a there's a mentality out there that when when Sasha Banks comes back, she's going to save the division, and when Charlotte Flair comes back, she's going to destroy the division. Okay, tell me you're biased without being biased, and also slightly tell me you're racist without telling me you're racist. But um, Charlotte Flair comes back, huge pap, as we say. Um, and yeah, everybody's happy to see her. She's got like really wicked looking new gear. The music is new. It's a different remix of the Ric Flair music, but it's not, it's not, I don't know what the word is, but like there's a little bit of grindiness behind her old theme. This one doesn't have nearly as much of that. It's more upbeat. It makes me kind of think that she's coming back as a face, which people are not going to like. Uh, she stands face to face with Ronda Rousey. She's like, oh, hey champ. Hey, Flair, how's your little arm doing? How's your little arm doing, Queenie? Let me guess. You want the next shot at me at the Royal Rumble? And Charlotte's like, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I want a shot at you tonight. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, Baszler tries to t tell her to get out of there. Baszler's like, you just you just had a match. Like, what the fuck are you doing? What is this? Type <laughs> Shayna Baszler is what any friend of Ronda Rousey should be saying in that particular moment. It's like, okay, you just beat Raquel Rodriguez, but she did beat the crap out of you before you beat her. Like, let's go. She's fresh. We don't know what kind of condition she's in. Um, but Ronda Rousey just lays the belt out in front of her, accepts the challenge, and Big Boot almost gets a fall. Uh, Flair boots Baszler off the apron. She goes for a spear. I will say she, the spear that she went for was really ugly. <laughs> I will say that. Uh, Charlotte Flair doesn't have the best spear in the world. The f spear at, doesn't even matter if it was effective or not. The spear gets countered into an armbar. The armbar gets countered into a roll-up. And yes, for all the SJWs out there, for all the ones that hate the Barbie dolls, for all the ones that hate it when anybody is white, blonde, successful, and has an unpopular dad... Charlotte Flair is now your 14-time WWE Women's Champion. And oh my God, say it with me, say it once, say it twice, say it again. It's awesome because it pisses off all the right people. Oh yes. And in the back she gave a, I didn't see this until I went and looked on Twitter, but she went and she gave a heartfelt speech about how the year has been for her, how she went to Saudi Arabia for the first time, how she beat Ronda Rousey for the first time how she got married to her husband and how she's she put the crown down for a couple of months and actually got to uh, enjoy life and whatnot. I think I think it's kind of cool that they let her mention Andrade. I mean, not by name, but they kind of let her me mention Andrade and God knows what he's doing right now. Um, really good. I know people are not going to let this happen. The, the, the loudest voices, the podcasters, the YouTubers, the, the Twitter troglodytes are not going to allow a Charlotte Flair face turn to happen, but it's uh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Oh, yes. Uh, so what's next? Uh, we replayed what most people have already seen on social media. That's Dom and Rhea coming once again to the Mysterio family for the holidays. They did the great Thanksgiving thing where they beat up Ray. Now they're going to Dominic's grandfather's house for Christmas. The police get called by Ray. They take Dominic away. Angie Mysterio slaps Rhea Ripley in the face, which makes me want to see Rhea Ripley versus Angie Mysterio. And you get the immortal quote from Dominic from the cop car of, call Finn, call Priest, I won't make it in jail, mommy. <laughs> it's fucking great. The, the Judgment Day are fucking wonderful. I don't even care. They're great. Then we get a segment that I... There is... There is, there's an idea out there that WWE doesn't listen to their fans, they don't pay attention to social media, they don't pay attention to Twitter, etc. And then sometimes they do. 
And then you get segments like this, because Hit Row are walking around in the back, in the locker room, they enter the ring, and, you know, super nice guys, the New Day, are bringing out, bringing out a broomstick, it's like, hey man, you know, we know you can't jump very high, is this very high for you, and all that kind of thing. Um, what's it called? Um, Mad Cat Moss is there, making jokes, even, like, they're even getting dunked on by Maximum Male Models, which is really bad. I'm just gonna say that's really bad. And Ricochet sort of breaks it all up, breaks it all up, stops all the jokes, and he says, hey guys, come on, come on, let's cut them some slack. They can't all be as good as me. And so they're all dunking on these guys for this guy that almost landed on his fucking face. In real life, okay, let's separate real life from the, from the kayfabe for a second. In real life, this guy could have broken his neck because that was a really bad botch that he did. Right, but he went on the same night to take the following week's SmackDown and have that match with the Usos on a pretty fucked up leg from all all accounts. So there's a little bit of credit that needs to go to Top Dollar. I'm just saying, I'm just going to stick up for my boy here, right? But here's my problem, right? Here's my problem. You got these two guys that have come off of a really bad botch one week and a loss to the Usos the following week, and you're going to run them through the dressing room where all the other tag teams that aren't doing shite either, by the way. Uh, where every single one of them's taking their dunk on this guy. He shoves Ricochet, so they leave the segment where, oh my god, what a dickhead top dollar is. It's like, no, 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 no. Six on two, you guys are going to come bring me all this shit. You're going to get shoved. Especially, look at me, I'm twice the size of you. And we'll get to why that happened in a minute later. But I thought that was that was so fucked up, and it's like, yes, yes, you guys are all supposed to be baby faces, right? Like... Ricochet is supposed to be a babyface. Mad Cat Moss is a babyface. New Day are the ultimate babyfaces. Oh my god, we need to give all the world titles to Kofi Kingston. Blah, 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 blah. These are your super nice guy babyfaces, and they're all dunking on this one guy for making one mistake. Uh, what did Kofi do at the Rumble this year? Did Kofi make a mistake? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he did. Moving on. But, like, the guy just gets sick of it, and he says, n n fuck off, pretty much. And now he's the bad guy. If that's not the most representative 2022 example, like, skit that resembles real life, I don't know what is. Um, we cut to Michael Cole on commentary, who, who confirms to us that Bray Wyatt versus LA Knight will be happening in the Royal Rumble. And it is what we've been hearing about for a while, the Mountain Dew Pitch Black match. And then does absolutely nothing to tell us what a Mountain Dew Pitch Black match is. Oh yes, Imperium come out, and it's getting late in the day now as we're watching the show. Imperium come out to brag a little bit. They throw, they show video highlights of of uh, Gunther's so impressive, so massive, so monstrous title reign, and they illustrate this by him beating four people: Shinsuke Nakamura, Rey Mysterio, Sheamus, and Ricochet. You need to. Like, they didn't need to go by name, is what I'm saying here. They could have just showed massive clips of him wrecking people, but they wanted to name them all off, and it's like, okay, his his massive mountainous reign or whatever is beating up four people. Now, one of them is Sheamus, and one of them is, you know, the other half of one of the most popular matches of this year, the one that they did at Clash at the Castle for the Intercontinental Championship. That match was fucking awesome. Don't get me wrong. But don't bother going and specifying that he only beat up four people. Because that, that does the opposite of what you think it's going to do. Gunther's great. It's fine. It's wonderful. He's interrupted by Strowman, who demands a title shot. He says, yeah, you know, there's no man here that can beat you. How about a monster? And then he takes out all three of them. Gunther eventually gets back up, hits him with chairs, throws him into the steps, and puts him into this really, really painful-looking, like, overhead key lock thing until he gets saved by Ricochet. Now, this is how you do what Drew McIntyre was doing earlier. When you see somebody getting... I don't care how big Braun Strowman is. Three-on-one is still three-on-one. And you want to set you want to set a message that these guys are not to be fucked with. Send Ricochet out to, to help out his brand-new buddy, you know, the Flippy and the Flopper. Um... And yeah, have the heels that have the numbers advantage, have them back down. That's an impressive, like, hey, we're not going to take this anymore thing. Not what we did earlier on in the night, where obviously three heels are going to back down from four faces. That's just... I think it's it's so interesting that in one night they did the good and the bad version of that. And then we go to the main event. Oh yes, and yes. Oh, this is a this is a last minute ratings grab. They're just trying to make the New Year's show feel special. Yep, and they did. 
Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn. Sorry, I was supposed to say Roman Reigns versus Sami Zayn. We'll probably get that next year. Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn versus Kevin Owens and John Cena. And when I, when I took note of this, the first intro started, there was 23 minutes left of the show. When the bell rang, there was 16 minutes left of the show. So... There was a lot of time spent on entrances. Huge pop for John Cena. So as much as I couldn't stand John Cena back in the day, much like I was going to say about Charlotte earlier, you can't you can't ignore it. You you just can't. Um, Sammy and KO start off the match. Sammy gets a uh, bloody nose bright and early to the point where Kevin Owens says, "Hey, what's what's that on what's that on your nose there?" Um, Sammy gets a tag to Roman first. Immediately, as soon as as soon as Roman gets the tag in, and he's the legal guy there's a chant for Cena. Now, they do this really cool thing where Cena's playing to the crowd and Kevin Owens is playing to John Cena, who's playing to the crowd. Roman Reigns makes him pay for it by just, like, leveling him with this huge, massive lariat. Cena and Roman didn't spend a whole lot of time in this match. Obviously, Cena didn't spend a lot of time in this match in general, to be fair. Most of the match is Sammy and Kevin Owens, obviously, with their respective big boys on the outside watching the match happen. At one point, Roman and Cena brawl to the outside and Cena gets thrown into the steps. There's a stiff pop-up powerbomb by Kevin Owens to Sami Zayn, but when he tries to do the same to Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns midair turns it into a Superman punch. John Cena finally gets in. John Cena, there's something hysterical about the fi him hitting the five moves of doom on Sami Zayn. Um, he, come, he gets a quick hit to Roman as well. He knocks them both down. KO comes in looking like a kid at Christmas time. He joins them in a double five knuckle shuffle. AA to Roman Reigns takes him right out of the ring leaving the uh, center stage for KO to hit a stunner on Sami Zayn for the win. What I like about this, what I like about this is as soon as they announce Cena coming, they're like, oh, something else is going to happen. This is going to be the night where the bloodline implodes. This is going to be the night where Roman turns on Sami. This is going to be the night where we find out who John Cena is facing at WrestleMania. This is going to be the night that the whole bloodline implodes. This is going to be the night where, you know, Cena turns heel, which I don't know where that one came from. But none of that happened. It was just a marquee... Like this is what they this is the match that they would tell you about if they wanted you to come to a house show. And I and I don't mean that in a bad way. This just was what it was. Cena came in to play the hits so that he can maintain his record of having a match every year for the past twenty years. Um the idea of John Cena being in a match with Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, who are rivals, but both had their first matches on the main roster with John Cena. We all remember Sami Zayn answering the uh, the U.S. Open Challenge and throwing out his arm, raising the roof on the way to the ring, and then KO came down for the U.S. Open Challenge as well when he was the NXT champion. And it's with all that storytelling aside, you could almost put the bloodline aside, which sounds crazy considering the bloodline is the biggest thing of the year. John Cena and Roman Reigns looked like they fell to the wayside when Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens were going at it one-on-one -on -one in the ring. And I think that's cool. As big as the bloodline is, as big as a big of a one-night get as John Cena is, you want to make that singles match, that Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, like that brotherhood that fell apart and, and came back together and fell apart, and I think we can do this forever, Batman, Joker, whatever you want to say. And the fact that that can take center stage with all the other big shit that's happening around it is fucking huge. And I mean, Kevin Owens standing up on the winning team on the last taped bit of TV content WWE does in 2022 ain't that bad either. He's got to be doing something big at WrestleMania. I've heard weird rumors that John Cena's going to face Logan Paul, which is just weird enough to happen in this wrestling climate. Um, I wouldn't mind if we got Kevin Owens and Sami if If they keep the, the bloodline together and they don't break the bloodline until after WrestleMania. I wouldn't mind them revisiting Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn just as a singles match at WrestleMania because you can do that. You can absolutely do that. Roman Reigns is going to face whoever he's going to face. At this point, it's going to be a 12-man match with, you know, Cody Rhodes and the and the Rock and and everybody that anybody wants to add in. You know, throw in CM Punk being the 31st entrant in the Royal Rumble and he'll get into that match as well. Hell, maybe uh, maybe John Cena gets himself in that match and Stone Cold comes down and stuns everybody. This was a really good show. This was a really nice way to this was a nice way to end the year after having sort of a lackluster pre-taped show and a clip show. I want to say, I am happy that they did the clip show so that the stars that could go home could go home and the stars that went to do the 
Madison Square Garden show could get a really big Madison Square Garden show payday. I thought that was really cool. The production staff got to go home and have a holiday. I have no problem with that. I needed a show like tonight to get me back on track, to get me back talking to you guys again, and this show delivered that to me in spades. The Wyatt stuff is absolutely weird and ridiculous and right up my street. The Charlotte Flair thing is going to piss everybody off, and yes, that's right up my street. And we just had a spectacular main event that that whose ramifications will ripple on into the new year, and that is also right up my street. Speaking of right up my street, speaking of rippling into the new year, what do we have to look forward to? Raw this week, we've got Bel Air versus Alexa Bliss for the Raw Women's Championship. We've got Austin Theory versus Seth Rollins for the United States Championship. We've got Ricochet versus Top Dollar next week on SmackDown in a Royal Rumble qualifying match. We'll talk about that later, I'm sure. We got the match that we were supposed to get ages ago. It's the Usos versus Sheamus and Drew McIntyre for the Tag Team Championships. And in two weeks, we are getting Strowman versus Gunther for the Intercontinental Championship. A lot of stuff to look forward to. Looking forward to the new year. Looking forward to that one other podcast that I haven't quite finished for you guys just yet. And like I say, next Monday, like 10 days from now, we will be back on track. We will be doing WWE last week. We will be talking probably about NXT because NXT at that point will be getting ready for New Year's Evil. Lots and lots of stuff to look forward to. I really hope you guys had a good holiday, whatever you're celebrating. As you're hearing this, as I drop it tomorrow morning, it will be New Year's Eve. I hope you guys have a hell of a New Year's Eve. I thank you for listening to me ramble and continuing to listening to me ramble into the new year. I've been Spaz, your YWC reality check. Subscribe up there, talk down there, start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I will talk to each and every last one of you later, but for right now, I am tagging it by. Take care. Bye.